Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. Some of you may remember that it took only three days for astronauts to reach the moon. Yet it's been almost three weeks, and we still don't have all the accurate results from the Iowa caucuses. And now we're told that it may take a while to get the results from the Nevada caucuses coming up this weekend. It begs the question, are caucuses relevant? Are they democratic? Should they even exist in the 21st century? We're going to talk about this with my guest, Jeff Stein. He's a talk show host on KXEL in Iowa. He's an author, historian, and broadcaster who's covered 11 years of Iowa caucuses and 40 years of politics in the state of Iowa. He's recognized as the foremost broadcast historian in the state, and his daily radio feature on Iowa history, Iowa Almanac, airs on two dozen stations statewide. It is my pleasure to welcome Jeff Stein to the Who, What, Why podcast. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. It is my privilege. Thanks so much for making the invitation. Happy to do it. You've covered a lot of Iowa caucuses. Talk first about how they've evolved. They used to be this small, sleepy little event that kicked off the process. They've become something entirely different today. And that really, Jeff, is the problem. Uh, First caucus I covered was in 1980. There have been 13 of them over the course of time, starting in 1972, So now I've been a part of 11 of them, and this one is probably going to merge into the 12th, I guess, uh, if they don't get things settled pretty soon. The way that it originally started was for people in a limited area, a precinct. You can't get smaller, right, than a precinct. And they would get together. They would talk about issues. They would select delegates to the county convention, and along the way that helped them interpret who they had a preference for because you would be – voting for a delegate to the county convention that mirrored your views on things, not only issues, but also a presidential candidate. And nobody really paid any attention to the first one in this modern era in 1972. This was all a reaction to the nightmare that the Democrats had with the National Convention in Chicago and the late Mayor Daley I back in 1968. So the party said, we've got to be more small-D Democratic, So we need to open up the process, no more smoke-filled rooms, no more party bosses. And that's what led to this kind of thing being revitalized. I mean, caucuses have been around in this state for 150 years, but not with regard to the presidential delegate selection process. So again, nobody paid much attention in 72. And then in 76, a guy named Jimmy Carter got more delegates than any other candidate running. And since he went from zero to first with that, Then he got the nomination. Then he became president. Everybody said, well, that's the playbook. That's how you do it. You have to be a winner or top three in Iowa. And that was all fine until about the last 12 years when the national parties just couldn't leave well enough alone. They tried to micromanage things. You get the big cable networks who are trying to turn everything into a made-for-TV event, and they basically ruined what was a pretty pure democratic process. And then tacked on to that this time, they made the counting process all the more complicated and then added a layer of untested technology to it. And this is for all the complaints people may have about Iowa or Iowans. And I'm sure that the folks who were running the caucus on the Democrat side made some mistakes, no question. But everything that people are pointing toward, Jeff, that's at the feet of Tom Perez. That's at the feet of the Democratic National Committee. Recall that they, and I'm going to be charitable here, had their thumb on the scale four years ago for Hillary Clinton. Well, in order to get Bernie Sanders to make nice and act like he was supporting Clinton in 2016 in the general election, they made all sorts of promises about opening up the process, in my mind, never intending to have to follow through on them. Well, Bernie held them to it. And they still never thought they'd have to worry much because who would would have thought that he would run again? Well, lo and behold, they forced states like Iowa to make changes in the caucus process. Now Bernie's a player, and all the chickens are coming home to roost. Look, no one in Iowa wanted to open up the caucus process to make it more and more resemble a primary. And you even have Tom Perez now saying he wants to get rid of all the caucuses. Well, he sabotaged them to make his point to get to his ultimate outcome. So they were required, the Iowa folks were required to change the caucuses, including the reporting of three different streams of data, and they were forced to use an app 
that was mandated by the DNC, funded by folks who had uh, horses in the race, as it were, untested to where even one of the top DNC IT people looked at it the morning of and said, well, it works now, but I have no idea what's going to happen when they put data in it. That doesn't give you much confidence, does it? So all of this, and you can tell by the way Perez is acting, where one minute he throws Iowa under the bus and then the backlash gets a little strong, so then he decides he'd better make nice and say we're all in this together. It, you know, you're going to have a nightmare in Nevada because they set it up to be that way, the national party. And they get what they deserve as far as I'm concerned after this. And with respect to Nevada, it may not have the app that caused the problem, but the whole problem with the three streams of data is exactly the same. There's no difference other than, as you say, Tom Perez says, we won't use that bad app again. Well, they're still using a form of technology that's never been tested. And again, it's the idea of we want to make this seem open. And so what we're going to do is actually raise more questions. Look, the idea of reporting, and I'll explain briefly the three streams of data. In the past, Democrats simply reported the delegate equivalents. Because really, what are we talking about? A nomination process with delegates. That's the way you keep score. You know, again, it's sort of like the popular versus electoral vote issue. I don't care about the popular vote because the rules say we keep score with electoral votes. So the idea is you report the delegates. That's how you determine who wins. But there are campaigns who sit in these precincts and count noses. And so they kind of come up with their own tabulation to cross-check and keep those running the caucus honest. So the National Party said, well, rather than have these uh, unofficial numbers come floating around from various campaigns, let's make sure that we distribute official numbers. Well, again, that's not what the purpose of the whole thing was. So you've added another layer to a process that, by definition, has become more, compli more complicated with more and more people being involved. And even though this really wasn't a record, no more people turned down on Iowa in 2020 than they did four years before that, uh, it still became just a real logjam. So again, what's different about Nevada other than the, than the app? And that's your excellent question. What's different? Nothing. So what's to lead us to believe we're going to have any better result in Nevada than we did in Iowa in terms of smoothness of process. I don't have any confidence at all. And it's interesting that Perez is already covering his rear end saying, well, maybe we won't have the results very quickly. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? I mean, and again, I have had Tom Perez on my radio program. He hasn't been on lately because I've invited him to come on and resign. And so apparently that he doesn't <laughs> seem to want to do that. But look, look at this whole process, the changing rules for debates. The candidates have no idea what the rules are because they keep changing. You know, it's kind of like we're happy. Anybody's happy to play a game if you know what the rules are. I heard someone on, the, or someone on Twitter suggested that Michael Bloomberg is really a plant for the Republicans, that he's spending this money just to stir things up on that side so that Trump gets reelected. Frankly, if there's a plant anywhere, I'm, I think it must be Tom Perez because nobody, unless you were deliberately trying to sabotage your party's efforts, would be running the debates, the primary and caucus schedule, all of this. You wouldn't run it that way if you actually were trying to give your party confidence in the system. Bernie's people still think they're getting it stolen from them because of the superdelegate thing, and they're probably going to wind up being right. And so, again, where's the confidence that Democrats should have, where's the confidence an independent should have about one of the two major political parties? It's non-existent. As Will Rogers once said, I'm not a member of any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and that was at a time when they just could organically sort of fight with one another and be disorganized. Now you have the official party apparatus sabotaging the efforts. You know, and maybe it's just incompetence. But, boy, you've got to be really incompetent for all of this to happen. I want to give them at least some credit for deliberately trying to do some of this because the incompetence argument is, is just hard to fathom. I want to go back and talk a little bit, especially since you've covered so many of these caucuses in Iowa as they've evolved, how this is seen through the eyes of the people that take the time out to, to learn the candidates, learn the issues, and participate in these events? 
Iowans are proud but humble people. They are very proud of what had been their role. And I take it back to not just 2020, 2016, 2012. Remember, the Republicans declared the wrong winner on caucus night. 2016 was a dead heat for the Democrats. 2020, a dead heat. So really, these last three have kind of given us an awkward feeling. But we're very proud of it, and we take it seriously. I have... I was born, raised, and have lived in Iowa my entire life. If I didn't like the winters, I'd leave. But the fact of the matter is we do have, you know, pretty obnoxious winters here. There's not a lot else to do. So why not have a group of people of above-average intelligence statistically who really care about it? This is our sport, all right? This is our pro sport. We don't have pro sports teams in the state. The caucuses, politics. This is our pro sports, and we take it very seriously. And so whenever we're attacked about it, we take offense. Right now, I would tell you that Iowans as a whole are mad. They're mad that their name, the state name, is being bandied about this way because I still maintain it's not of the Iowans' making. And so Iowa Democrats are upset because they just did what their national party said to do because otherwise their delegates wouldn't get seated. And so, you know, the, the feeling in the state is we are now tired of hearing about it because it's not a happy thing, but we're also mad because we think we have not been treated well by these folks from out of town. And I think there's ample evidence to support that, Jeff. Well, there's much talk now about the caucuses going away, particularly Iowa, particularly Iowa as the first. How do the people there feel about that at this point, given the, the spotlight that is now on them? Well, again, it comes back to we think we have done our jobs well. Our job is not to pick the presidential nominee. If that's the case, you don't need any of the rest of the caucuses or primaries. I don't understand these folks who say, oh, my goodness, we've had two contests, Iowa and New Hampshire, and we have no idea who the nominee will be. Really? You, you, you want to settle it that quickly? What's the point of the other 48 states weighing in or whatever? So, you know, we're very proud of the part in the process because we think we take our job seriously. Our job is to be a BS detector, is to winnow the field in most years, and play a role, not the role, but a role. And if it is taken away because of something not of our own making, well, that's not going to sit real well. Uh, but, you know, I do have to say, uh, and, and, and I've talked to others on the national level who sort of play along with this, we've almost become a victim of our own success. You know, there's no way to go back to the church basements and living rooms of the late 1970s, or early 1980s. This has gotten bigger than all that. But I still think there's a way to save the core of it if you just have these national folks who think they know better and one size fits all, just leave us alone. You know, there, there's a fellow by the name of Dave Nagel, Dave has been associated with the caucuses now for some 50 years. He was a congressman from Iowa. He was a state party chair. He's a Democrat. He's now in his mid-70s, still practicing law, literally three blocks away from where I'm, I'm sitting right now. And when they first started talking about these changes a year and a half ago, I had him come into the radio studio, and they said, well, what do you think of all this? And his response was, well, we'd really rather that they just leave us alone because we know what we're doing. And he was so right. Because he could sense that when you have other people telling the state how to run its delegate selection process, you're missing the whole point. Because what works in New York City doesn't work in Eldora, Iowa. And so let the states, I mean, that's, whole, that's the, part of the whole point of a republic, isn't it? So why not just let the states do it their own way? No, nope, party can't help itself. And this is, this is what they get for it. And, and we're being drugged through the mud with them. And how is Iowa anticipating what they're about to see in Nevada this weekend? Uh, we feel for these folks, you know, I <laughs> mean, because I've seen how this movie ends, right? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting because there's, there's been talk, and, and the, the, um, the scapegoat in Iowa, the one who walked the plank, was the state party chair, Troy Price, who wanted to see this through but got pressure from folks nationally to get out of the way and be the scapegoat, and he, he was a good soldier and did. But the thing that, that's interesting in, uh, you know, when he was asked about this in the first week or so after the caucus is he said, look, every four years we have this conversation. 
Every four years, somebody thinks they have a better plan. Every four years, somebody tries to take it away from Iowa, and we just assume that'll happen again. Now, whether they'll be more successful or not is a different issue. I can guarantee you if, uh, for whatever reason, Pete Buttigieg becomes president because he won in Iowa, he's not going to want to change anything. You know, success breeds success. And that's really to, to the point of how the caucuses have stayed viable all this time. Because somebody in power looks at it, well, even someone like Trump who didn't win in Iowa but understands how that helped him, uh, he says, hey, you know, as long as I've got anything to say in the Republican Party, we're not changing anything. And so that's, you know, Obama was the same way. He won, so he didn't want to change it uh, in, during his eight years in office. So it, it, until somebody can come up with how to build a better mousetrap, I still have some confidence that you and I will have this conversation in four years, hopefully with a, a much happier Iowa caucus outcome. Would Iowa settle for a primary? Well, we have a primary for state races. And we have it in June. And the problem is if you had a presidential primary, you either have to have a second event, which costs much more money, or you have it in June when it's irrelevant, or you move your state primary earlier, and that kind of you know, balls up the works with the state legislature. The, the idea, and, and you wouldn't be first in the nation because New Hampshire would fight you for it. So the, the thing to understand is the reason we have caucuses is they're a party-building apparatus. Primaries are not. Primaries are simply about trying to get people to vote. With the caucus, and they have caucuses when there's not a presidential election, we just don't pay attention to it. The idea is this is when they start working databases, where they try to get more voters to be registered and involved in the party, where they start selecting candidates for state office if nobody is there to run. This is how they build ground game for state politics, and that includes a presidential election, a general election. So if you get rid of the presidential caucuses, they're still going to have caucuses. And basically, we just have no say in, in the, the process, because I just, you know, it's fine, go ahead and have your presidential primary in June, but it's not going to mean anything. You know, California had theirs in June for, for generations until they realized they were losing out, and so they were willing to spend the money for a Super Tuesday presidential primary, and who knows if that's going to be a good idea this year or not. What ability is there now that, that everybody is so plugged into this and everybody thinks they're a pundit and following all of this, the degree to which there's an opportunity for mischief in these primaries, people from the other party participating to try and get what they perceive to be as a weaker candidate? Well, you have that in New Hampshire, right? You can go in and you can vote any, pl any way you want, right? The thing with the caucus, and this is to your point, with the caucus, you're with your neighbors. And if the, the neighborhood strong Republican shows up at a Democrat caucus, well, that doesn't happen because the neighbors say, wait a second, you're, you're the fox in the hen house here. You're the skunk. Get out. With the primary, if it's an open primary, well, you really don't know what mischief might be created. And even if it's a closed primary, you go up, you change your registration, do you take the ballot, you go vote, you turn it in, you change your registration back. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's, you know, the rules allow it very, very clearly. I was hearing someone today advocate for a wide-open primary, like in a state like Louisiana, where everybody's on the ballot and the top two vote-getters go to the general election, even if they're from the same party. You know, that kind of defeats the whole point of a strong party, doesn't it? Uh, because it, it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense unless the state is so biased in one direction. There's no point in having the other party even show up. But, you know, the, the, the mischief that can be created in a closed system is nothing more than me saying to my wife, yep, this is who I'm going to vote for, then I go in and do something else, and she never knows. You know, any of this can happen. As you, as you multiply that out, and, and, it, and it's impossible to uh, do polling on it because, again, that whole industry has been corrupted, uh, especially by people who, well, frankly, just like to mess with the pollsters. Do you think that the people in Iowa at this point, and you talk to them every day, so you have the best sense of this, really want to see this whole thing collapse in Nevada this weekend in the hope that it teaches the party a lesson and Iowa's not out there hanging all by itself? You know, and I'm an independent, so therefore my interest is in uh, 
you know, essentially in good government, but I'm a big honk for Iowa. And so, yeah, there's a part of me that wants to see Nevada crash and burn worse than Iowa did, so that at the very least, it's not just us. Now, that's, that's a terrible thing to admit, but I will, because I'd love to see us keep our role, because I don't think what happened uh, a couple of weeks ago is our fault. I don't know how widespread that is, uh, because that, that's really kind of nasty to hope that these folks who've put in as much time there as we did here to have a failure. But if it exposes the corruption that I maintain is going on within the high levels of the Democrat Party, well, maybe you have to tear it down fully before you can build it back up. And they didn't tear it down after 2018. They just kind of put, uh, as, as we say around here uh, in hog country, lipstick on the pig. <laughs> and will the people in Iowa look at this in a way that impacts, you think, or influences how they might vote come November? No, I really don't think so, because the, the fact of the matter is there were about 170,000 Iowa Democrats who showed up out of 620,000. Well, there are more Republicans than that, about 650,000 registered in Iowa, but there are about 750,000 non-affiliated or independent voters. In other words, again, independents, many more of those than either Republicans or Democrats. So it's just kind of an entertaining sideshow for those who don't have a party affiliation. They just sit back and say, okay, we have three official parties in Iowa, Republican, Democrat, and Libertarian. Okay, you tell us who your choices are, put up your best candidates, and then I as an independent, I'll decide. So they're just kind of sitting back and waiting. Uh, the rest of it is just, uh, just noise to them, frankly. If nothing else, it increases the attendance and the national exposure for the state fair. Yeah, you got to love to see people grabbing turkey legs as big as your head and, uh, you know, other food on a stick. Uh, it, it's, it's entertaining to see how uncomfortable those people are. You know, when, when you see these people who are used to either eating a different way, uh, well, there were two candidates in the Democrat field who were vegan, you know, and they get thrust a, you know, a turkey leg to gnaw on as they walk through the, uh, the state fair. But one of the things that's interesting is, yes, we do have that. Uh, so, for example, in the 2020 caucus, they're all there at the 2019 Iowa State Fair. But you'll see, you saw them in 2018, the ones who were just kind of testing the waters. And then, you know, it, it, basically the state fair just now is a time where, and there's a special place where the, uh, the uh, newspaper has a soapbox, and that's where they come and gather and, uh, and act very awkward out of their element, which, again, is kind of entertaining for some of us to see as well. Uh, interesting, you know, if you think of it, back in uh, 2016, or the 2015 uh, state fair, 2016 caucus, Trump shows up in his helicopter, lands it on a field outside the fairgrounds, but he acted in a full suit more normal than some of these other folks. He gave kids a tour of the helicopter. He, you know, went around the state fair. He, just, he a interacted with people and just acted much more like one of the people than some of these folks who had their aides go to a farm store and buy them a denim shirt thinking that was going to help them fit in. It was just so obvious uh, you know, the price tag might have as well been hanging off of it. <laughs> Build it and they will come, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Nice <laughs> Iowa reference. <laughs> Jeff Stein, I thank you so much for spending some time with us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing what happens this weekend in Nevada. Great fun. Call anytime. Happy to talk with you again. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.